mulai Bapak dan Ibu, Pak Restu, Pak Yudis, Mangga kita mulai Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at this time being, we are honored to have Dr. Hao Zhang uh, here with us to present her research uh, in terms, not her research, not his research. I mean, this is your work, right, Dr. Hao? So we have Dr. Hao. We are no longer PhD student. I, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my beloved uh, colleagues, students uh, from Indonesia University of Education, and also the students from outside uh, UPI, welcome to our 12th uh, architecture lecture series. Uh, we have Dr. Hao Zhang. Is going to present his current work uh, pertinent to developing low medium income housing in Rochester, New York City. Not New York City, New York State, United States. So before uh, Dr. Hausang uh, begin his presentation, uh, let me briefly read his CV. So he is currently the vice president at Urban League of Rochester Economic Development Corporation. It is located in New York State, uh, United States. Um, I'm happy to call Dr. Hao Zhang my beloved friend because we closely worked together during our PhD um, time in uh, university at Buffalo, United States. So his expertise is pertinent to uh, sustainable development and healthy cities, special models, urban revitalization, affordable housing, transportation planning, and international planning. So his passion is to continuously improve our built environment to become more human-centered with interdisciplinary skills, incorporating urban planning, geography, public health. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Hausang will present his current work. And Dr. Hausang, you may have like one hour or one and 15 uh, minutes of presentation. Okay. And it will be followed by uh, the question and answer or a discussion session. Uh, untuk a Rekan-rekan uh, mahasiswa yang nanti akan berpartisipasi di sesi tanya jawab, mangga nanti apabila ingin mengajukan pertanyaan bisa diajukan lewat chat box um, uh, dengan bahasa Indonesia pun tidak apa-apa. Nanti akan saya coba untuk translate dan sampaikan kepada uh, Dr. Hausang. Uh, Mudah-mudahan apa yang akan disampaikan ini uh, bermanfaat. Bisa simak. Uh, dulu paparan dari uh, Dr. Zhang. Uh, Dr. Hao Zhang, uh, please. Oh, thank you. First, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Yoham. And um, yes, I am very honored to be invited to this distinguished architecture lecture series uh, from UPI. And uh, um, I would say Professor Yoham is my uh, definitely long-term friends, colleagues, we collaborated a lot during the, um, our PhD journey, which is long and it's uh, not easy. <laughs> Let's put it there. Um, at the University of Buffalo, and we had a lot of um, good memories together. And we meet each other's families. And it's just, it's wonderful. It's amazing. And uh, as Professor Johan mentioned earlier, my um, interest is kind of too broad, I guess with healthy cities, sustainability, transportation, and now housing. Actually, I'm, um, I have to confess that I'm fairly new in this field, housing. I did took a course um, of the real estate development of the actually provided by um, University of Buffalo's master program because we got a master program there for real estate development. I took one course, then I had some interest in that. And after I graduate, um, I decided to become a practitioner. So I look for jobs and, you know, the, in the COVID, the whole world basically shut down. And about after a year, um, I would say, I probably joined the Urban League of Rochester. 
Um, and uh, you can say, uh, so now I'm the vice president of the Urban League of Rochester Economic Development Corporation, in short, ULREDC. And uh, I will you know, give you more background of ULREDC, which is a subsidiary corporation of the Urban League of Rochester. And uh, today my topic is uh, developing low medium income housing. So, so because the, um, I'm fairly new in the field, so I'm still learning it myself too. And uh, okay, let's begin. So um, low income or medium income housing, also we generalize call it affordable housing. For those of you not um, familiar, too familiar about affordable housing. So what is affordable housing? It is good to have some definition. I mean, different countries have different um, definitions, but in general, in the, in the West, because this definition pulled online from, I think, Australian government, and US government basically have a very similar definition. And the benchmark or standard is very similar to what it is being called affordable. So affordable housing is housing that is appropriate for the needs of a range of very low to moderate income households and priced so that these households are also able to meet other basic living costs such as food, clothing, transport, medical care, health care, and education. So in general, in the, the federal government of the United States um, regulated that if the uh, spent in housing less than 30% of the whole annual income of a household, then that housing could be considered as affordable. And that benchmark also applies to Australia, UK, um, a number of uh, like Western states. Okay, and, um, okay. Next. Mm -hmm. Don't know, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, and I found this actually very, very interesting. Um, video, which is very short, it's like uh, three minutes around, talk about what is affordable housing, especially under the American context in the US. So here it is. Let's watch it. Can you all hear it? I don't Can you think hear, we it? hear the, we don't hear the, the sound of the video. Okay, let me, let me play again. No, or oh, yes? Um, not yet. Maybe in the sharing uh, setting, uh, your sharing setting, you should take yes. the, the voice or share the, the voice. Or share, share sound. The, yeah, share sound. Share sound, let me see. New share, okay. So you can uh, stop sharing first and then reshare by taking a, uh, a tick, tick mark in the lower left corner of uh, the sharing setting. Let me see. Oh, so you say, okay, that share, share screen part, right? Yeah. Okay, then I just click it? Yes. Then, yep. then start, sh okay. Uh -huh. then, then, then this four point set slide, right? Yes. I just, just want to see how to, okay. Now, should I try again? Yes. I just wanna, okay. Can you hear it or no? Um, not yet. Not yet. So. Bu Ilham harus di share voice-nya, Bu Ilham. Di share-nya yeah. itu. In the... Left, you uh, can bottom click left. the share, bottom share, and you can find the find the voice share. Not voice share. share. Sorry. Sound share. Share sound. Share sound. Share sound. You you did it. How? Uh no. What did you say? Sorry. Just uh, stop sharing now or no or more. You want to see where it's share sound? Oh, share sound. I sorry. Okay, let's see. As a policymaker, yeah, okay. it, yes, perfect. You, Great. you probably hear often about, about the high cost of housing. 
Residents are feeling pressured by sky-high rents and home prices, and they want you Sorry. to do something about it. The impact of high housing costs goes beyond a single household wallet to affect entire communities. High housing costs in your area could be making it hard for your local school district to recruit teachers or your local fire department to hire firefighters. Increasing housing costs may even force some residents to choose between paying the rent and paying for food or health care. But people shouldn't have to choose between one basic necessity and another. That's where affordable housing comes in. Affordable housing is housing that a household can pay for, while still spending up for other necessities like food, and health care. That means that what's considered affordable depends on a household's income. The federal government typically defines housing as affordable when it consumes no more than 30% of a household's income. So, who needs affordable housing? Everyone, from high-income earners to hourly wage workers to the homeless and everyone in between. The rent or home price that is affordable <coughs> may vary from one household to the other. The need for housing that is affordable is shared by everyone. The good news is that the housing needs of many families are met adequately by the private market. In other words, housing costs for a high-income CEO are usually not cause for too much public concern. The bad news is that a large and growing share of the population cannot afford its housing costs. Nationally, more than one in seven households are what economists call severely cost-burdened. This means that they pay half or more of their income on housing. You probably wouldn't be surprised to hear that the lowest income households are the most likely to find themselves in this crunch. 70% of the lowest income households, those with less than about $15,000 in annual income, are severely cost burdened. Even moderate income renters are struggling to pay rent in many high cost cities. And it's not just a renter's problem. Although more than a quarter of renters, 11 million households, have severe housing cost burdens, so do about 1 in 10 homeowners for another roughly 8 million households. You might be thinking, I get it. I know it's a problem, but what can I do about it? The answer is, a lot. As a public official or community leader, you can make a big impact, even if you have limited funding available. Through incentives, zoning changes, and targeted investments, it's possible to significantly expand the availability of affordable housing. Oh, shoot. Sorry, a million present. households have severe housing cost burdens. Oh, it's a problem, but what can I... As a public official or community leader, you can make a big impact, even if you have limited funding available. Through incentives, zoning changes, and targeted investments, it's possible to significantly expand the availability of affordable housing in your community. Let's get started, together, in meeting this important challenge. It's pretty inspiring, huh? <laughs> okay. So we uh, discussed the huge needs of affordable housing um, in the United States. And um, we know there's not enough affordable housing in the US. And for every 100 extremely low income households, there are only 29 adequate affordable and available rental units. That is to say, for like uh, saying two parents who make minimum working wage with their kids, they have to wait for years just for a decent, affordable, safe housing. And with these huge needs, then you will ask then why not developers racing to build affordable housing. Well, the practice shows building affordable housing is not particularly affordable. And why the reason behind that is really financial or financing related. And um, it's have a lot of factors. I will give you some um, basic understandings about it. Because development costs a lot of money. And as developers, you usually they have to borrow like loans or monies from the investors. Without those subsidiaries, 
developing affordable housing sometimes is literally impossible. Because usually the size of the loan an investor is will, are willing, the investor is willing to give, give is based on their expected revenue return. Like saying, if they build that property and after the completion, how many tenants will move in? What's the occupancy rate? Can the whole property filled with tenants and how much can they pay? This all affects the total revenue, um, projected revenue. And if you set affordable housing to the so-called affordable level, which um, in a lot of cases in the US, they use this criteria called AMI, area medium income. So usually if you want a, a property called affordable, you have to recruit renters making their annual wage will be less than 60% AMI, 60% area medium income. So if people make more than that, then they're not qualified to live in this um, affordable housing. You'll have to make less than that amount. And it, so you set the rent to that level, then it's really, then you create a huge gap between the total development cost to build these buildings and manage them, operating them, to the actual projected revenue. So a lot of times the investors are not willing and they shouldn't to lend those loans to developers. So to uh, um, build affordable housing in today's age really, really requires subsidiaries from um, federal government, state government and local government and a number of different funding sources. And you can find actually a very um, interesting information on this um, Urban Institute's interactive tool. They have a website interactive tool and they showed you like a whole bunch of different, um, a whole bunch of different uh, factors that affect the, um, how to close in the gap of the uses and the sources. The uses are like um, what the cost will be for like developing affordable housing, like with a lot of cost and the sources, like how, what kind of funding source I can get. And that's very interesting, actually. I encourage you to check that website. I put the link here. And um, if you click that, you can actually see, closed, okay. You can actually see something like here. Let me share again. I just wanna share real quick. Oh, here. Yeah, if you can see, the cost of affordable housing does it depend so out? And they actually have some. Um, this is a gap. You can see on the your right side of the website, you see a deficit number about 12 million. And you can see they have some um, uh, showing the gap, literally. And if you keep going down, they show the source and the uses. And you can play, for example, you change the vacancy rate to less. Then you see the deficit become less because that's less vacancy. Right, and it, um, also, if you um, build more units, uh, uh, fifty units, or build hundred units, you can see hundred units has a less deficit too. So the gap can get um, closed up a little. And they just have all these factors, and if you play with it, it's actually a pretty interesting tool. Okay, let's get back to the um, to the. Are you seeing the PowerPoint slide now? Yes, we are still uh, seeing your PowerPoint slide. And no, 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 the it's still the oh, web. the website. Okay, I think I have to uh, re-share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's a different. Uh, perfect. Okay. So we said all these uh, difficult parts of building affordable housing. It's not affordable the developers have to be very creative. But we still see affordable housing pop up everywhere in the US. So how is affordable housing built? In the US, the primary source of development funding is called Low Income Housing Tax Credit, LIHTC. This is a federal tax credit administrated by state agencies. And uh, most affordable housing that gets built receives an allocation of tax credits. I will explain a little about it and you can find more information on Urban Institute's website. So um, yes, that is 
correct, we use LIHTC, the tax credit. A lot of our projects are tax credit, although our early projects are more funded by HUD, the US Department of Housing and Deve Urban Development. So um, this is basically, Johan, I don't know if you still remember our good old friend IRS. We have to do tax returns and they kind of re give those tax credits as a federal um, subsidiary to those houses. Oh, you got the memory? Yeah, yeah, IRS. Yeah, our good old friend. <laughs> and um, but federal government they don't directly just allocate those on um, the tax credit to each developers. They give this to different states based on their populations in New York and California because we have those states have more population, so they get more than tax credits. And in this uh, state agencies basically giving or allocate those tax credits to the developers or for affordable housing based on a very competitive process. So it's not like saying, okay, I have a good intent. I want to develop affordable housing and I can do that. No, because other developers want to develop maybe in the same area or same city, same, you know, county. And this is a really competitive process. Usually a year, maybe get um, two or three um, for each state. I'm not quite sure about the number, but it's a competitive process. And for New York State, the state agency that allocate tax credits to developers is called New York State HCR, Homes and Community Renewer. New York State HCR, that's where um, they basically administrate um, all the tax credits received from the IRS, the federal government. And um, yes, so besides that, but in this tax credit, and then the developers can using those tax credits, if they somehow manage to receive those tax credits successfully to um, using the tax credits to trade with investors for their cash to build those development because tax credits doesn't really just become cash. Usually say you sell $1 of tax credits to a developer and they pay 80 cents to you. Then you will be asking them, why would I not do like $1 tax credits, ask them to pay $1? then the developers won't do it because they want to make a profit. However, you say, oh, then you're doing a losing bargain. You are like, let them to have the 20 cents, but the cash they provide is in present because we don't have the financial ability that we need the cash to develop those um, affordable housing. And those affordable housing, usually the total cost um, millions of dollars. Like our, both our like most recent projects, each of them are over 10 million. US dollars. So uh, we need those current or present cash to develop those uh, properties. And so in that tax credit dollar usually are the largest source for um, affordable housing development, usually takes about 70% or at least two thirds of the total development cost. And besides that um, tax credit uh, fundings, Sometimes the developer also use a mortgage, like they have a mortgage or loan from the bank. And besides the mortgage and tax credit, they still need to figure out some like other funding sources. So the developer of affordable housing have to be very, very creative. They have to be have, have the ability to talk to different um, trust fundings, fund trust, just to get as many um, like sources as possible to make the affordable housing development project feasible. So besides the mortgage and tax credit, some other funding sources include federal block grants. And the largest federal block grants are the Home Investment Partnership Program. And also we have Community Development Block Grant, pro, uh, block grant Program. And some other foundations in like local trust funds or state housing trust fund, funds. And also some states also give um, the property, affordable housing properties, some tax reliefs, and also you receive tax credits for the clean energy. Then you use a solar panel or using a historic building saying it's not like a new build, but you renovate like a de deteriorated um, historic building. You get some tax, like extra additional tax credit for that too. Like one of our um, project actually, Jefferson Wall and stuff, I will discuss later actually got some brownfield tax credits because it was built on like a brownfield. So you need some extra cost, labor and material to clean that field first. 
And uh, um, the, the last one, which is very, very important too, is called federal rental assistance. This is usually for after the property is completed, um, the federal government paying some of the rent parts, which uh, makes the developers be very confident when they negotiate with investors saying, okay, after the project is completed, we not only will have enough renters, also these renters will pay the rent as regulated because actually it's not the renter paying the rent, it's the federal government is paying the rent through those uh, federal rental assistance. Yeah, that's just a lot of sources have to keep in mind. And, and so the whole development stages, this is not only applied to affordable housing development, it also applies to most real estate development. You will see those eight stage model in, um, I would say the mainstream, the majority of real estate development textbooks or online training courses. So the first one is inception of an idea. Idea inception is more like a, um, brainstorm, the developers meet each other, their partners, their consultants, discuss, hey, okay, we want to build a um, property, like uh, affordable housing here in this location, this area of the city or at the suburb. Let's see if it will work. Then refinement of the idea, you start thinking, oh, do we want to build like a single family house? We want to build a multiple family, two family, how many bedrooms? You start just think about it, refine it. Then it kind of comes goes to a feasibility study period, which is like a pilot study. You actually takes more, um, you hire staff or you um, have your own like staff to do those due diligence before you to see if the, um, if the project is feasible. And if the project is feasible, you go to the contract negotiation stage that actually you meet with the architects because they have to design the affordable house. Uh, the contractors or builders and see their costs, whether the material costs, the labor costs, et cetera. And you meet with engineers because you don't want to build a house. It's beautiful design. Then the house collapsed somehow because you know, there's some engineer issues. Then you meet with the environmental um, as, uh, analysis people saying like Stantec for one of, oh, uh, as a company, as one of uh, our projects that we used, because you want to see whether it meets some environmental standards, especially for rural housing, and whether it's led. And for these first four stages, you can always go back saying at the feasibility study, if we find the market is not, it's a weak market, it's not like strong enough to support the project, you go back to inception of an idea, you modify your idea, you keep refining your idea. Then all in the ne contract negotiation, if you find you know the labor cost or, or the material cost is too much to support the project, then you go back to the idea inception to, to um, refine your, your idea. However, after you negotiate with all different um, stakeholders or different parties in this afford affordable housing development process, then you kind of go into a commitment stage, which there's no way, no term, back ways. So, and then you uh, negotiate formal contract, which you, there's a lot of signature required from the owner, the developer, and the uh, architects, engineers, and builders, etc. And then after you sign those contracts, then it moves to the construction stage, which um, usually costs maybe a year or two, to, to less than two years to, to finish the project. Then you go to the completion stage, then you form an opening, you do advertisement, marketing, you try to recruit as many as tenants as possible to fill those lots you build, because you do want to generate, maximize um, um, revenue. And in the end, you go to the property asset and portfolio management stage, because you want to, uh, it's a healthy project. You want your project to be sustainable and stable. So, and you don't want the project to fail after you get all these sources, you invest the enormous manpower, <laughs> brain drain and foundings. You want to see your project um, generate like good revenue and actually benefit the um, community by, you know, having low or medium income tenants to live there. Okay, so this basically shows you some um, images of the um, those eight stages. It doesn't cover all the eight stages, um, but see the first two are basically 
on the upper part of the slides, I show you we visit those sites for our um our like project. The most recent one still under construction is called the Lease to Purchase West Side Project. It's a started um site, single family housing, forty one units, and we have to see those. You see those plates, flakes, or like you know little uh, wooden pillows like poke out. Those are the sites. Those are the vacant sites that and the affordable housing or the single family units will be built. And you have to drive through or, or walk around those areas to see if the site is appropriate to build those houses, whether they're too narrow, whether the, um, there's neighbors like, you know, using like put their cars, boats, whatever on these um, vacant lots. Then you see um, the one on the lower left is basically dig the foundation. You have to dig the foundation before you actually start building the house. On the lower right, you see, start building the house. And uh, in the later slides, I will show you more um, the projects after it's been completed or part partially completed images. Okay, so uh, just a little bit background of um, the organization. Um, my organization, Urban League of Rochester Economic Development Corporation, and I put the website there. Uh, you can see it's um, you can see it's um, you can find all this information there, like the projects that we have done, and the project is currently undergoing, and uh, just a lot of things to explore. And we are a subsidiary, like I mentioned earlier, of the Urban League of Rochester, which Urban League of Rochester is a nonprofit. It's a, um, to promote civil rights. Basically, is to um, ensure that African Americans. Latino, Latinas, the poor, the disadvantaged population um, have to secure their economic self-reliance, parity, um, and civil rights. And we have, the Urban League of Rochester has a number of um, pro programs to help with the, to help, to help the people, the disadvantaged population, such as business development, um, like youth education and housing, which is mostly the URDC focus on. And you can also check um, their website to see more information about it. And it's currently under the leadership of Dr. Chanel Hawkins. She's the president of the Urban League of Rochester and the CEO. Um, so for the Urban League of Rochester Economic Development Corporation, our mission, is to uh, improve the living and working conditions of poor, disadvantaged, and underserved populations. <laughs> um, <laughs> through economic development and the community revitalization initiatives, and meanwhile, we also build a very highly visible because you can see those affordable um, projects, affordable housing properties in different parts of the city or the suburbs. So we build an asset base for the Urban League of Rochester. And we also promote the Urban League of Rochester's programs in business development, like uh, enhance their building skills or use education for um, those low, in low or medium income tenants, kids to participate. So it's a mutual beneficial um, relationship. And also some background. So UAREDC has focused its efforts on the development of affordable single family housing, whether it's new construction or rehabilitation from the existing buildings for low or moderate income first time home buyers as well as affordable rental housing. And by partnering with a variety of contractors, builders, UREDC has developed and sold more than 500 homes in the city of Rochester and suburban Monroe County, because Rochester is located in the Monroe County. And for the, its geographic location, you can see that Rochester is a city located in the northeast of the United States. And, uh, and in the um, map, it's just from Google map, and down there you can see uh, we are kind of at the north, the north, west of New York City, because you all heard about New York City, we're at the Northwest, and we're very, very close from the Buffalo, where Johan, Professor Johan and I went for our doctor program, it's like one hour drive, basically. 
So yeah, they're all located in there near uh, the US Canada border near Toronto. So that's the geographic location. And the URADC has been developing affordable rental housing for over 20 years. And currently we have developed 14 properties located in the city of Rochester, towns of Haryana and Brighton and Orland County and serving a variety of populations. And we have the 15th pro project leads to purchase L2P west side un un under construction. This just shows you some um, projects that we have built, like one of the um, project Mills and Mickelson in Rochester, that's a Mickelson Apartments. It's, uh, I think, four story, like rental, uh, affordable rental housing. And also Brooks Village, that's for um, mostly low income senior, senior citizens to um, yeah, live there. So for our multifamily rental housing projects, our goal was to create safe, decent and affordable rental housing and uh, to contribute to the neighborhood revitalization and stabilization and basically build a more inclusive neighborhood. And also some like highly visible projects for the um, Urban League of Rochester. And it creates permanent and construction jobs because while we are um, building, we, need, we can hire the local residents um, to participate in the construction and that's job creation. So we early foundings are from HUD section 202 and the HUD section 811, which serve low income early and people with development and physical disabilities. I think um, HUD section 202 basically is HUD provide funding for um, affordable housing that built to serve the low income early population. And section 811 is to serve um, also the funding are provided by U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the um, for populate people with developmental and uh, physical disabilities. That's like some supportive housing. So, and uh, then you are EDC have developed tax um, credit projects since 2005 and uh, with much more complicated financing because you know now tax credit are not um, enough. It's take the most large chunk and then you have to get the, um, just a number of funding source from different, whether it's a, a mortgage or the trust funds, home funds, just from all different funding source. You have to close the gap. And to talk a little about the uses and sources. Well, uses basically are the cost, a whole total development cost. That's anything you have to do before, like a pre-development stage, you have to, um, write a pro forma. I'm not gonna go deep with all the financial details and showing you all the pro formas, but I can give you some general idea with a big chunk of uses and sourcing. For the uses, the first chunk will be the acquisition cost. So because the land here are private, well, some are owned by the city, the publicly owned, but a lot of lands are private. So if you wanna, you, you, when you decide where are the lands that your project will be built, you have to buy those land, buy the site, which refers to this acquisition cost. And if um, some developers use the city owned or county owned uh, the, um, the land for development, but if it's owned by private, there's really little thing a developer can do to minimize those costs. Because we always want to try to minimize the cost. And the, um, the second, cost, which will be the lar largest single cost, will be the construction cost. Because once you do the, um, you start doing that, we have the cost as the hard cost and soft cost. So the hard cost usually is just the construction, the builder, the contractor, the build the brick and mortar. Basically, that part of the cost. You have to consider the labor cost, the material cost. And during the pandemic, all these costs, I would say, soared like really, really sore. So you will, I, will, I will have to deal a lot of with about the, and the change of orders, yes, et cetera. It's, it is a lot of, um, yeah, that's a big, the biggest chunk of the cost during the develop, among the whole and development cost. 
Then you have this uh, developer fee, development or called also development fee. It's also included in the development cost. Basically, that shows how much the developers should make because um, developers have to use their own time to hire staff to uh, run an office for to negotiate with different parties. And those times and efforts should be compensated, and developers shouldn't do any projects without such compensation. And sometimes the developers agree on a different development fee to cover some part of the development costing. They don't get that part of the development fee that they're supposed to get a receivable development fee um, because they want to try to just close the gap of the total development cost. And that's the uses. And the sources mostly will be after the development will be the revenue from the uh, from the, um, the the rent the paid from the renters. And you will find more of this information from the Urban Institute website if you're interested. And challenges. So during all these years, we have challenges such as difficulty to find sites, uh, costs continue to increase. That's just like I mentioned earlier, the material costs, costs are definitely not a, definitely grow rapidly during a pandemic, which requires more layers of funding. We have to find more funding sources. Then it's become difficult to secure funding because it is, it is competitive because you're not the only developer trying to develop, build affordable housing in the city or in this region. And you have to compete with other developers for affordable housing fundings. And sometimes another complicated part is because you need all these different layers of funding, the timing become an issue. So even if you're lucky, you get a, like a one grant, um, you don't have to pay back, then you still need maybe waiting for six months or a year to get another funding, which this could be fatal to a project. It could kill the project before it's even, it even started. So, um, some states are actually trying to coordinate the timing of different funding sources. So make the project go more smoothly so developers then have to wait a significant amount of time to just to receive all different channels of the funding. And also it requires guarantees over 15 year um, low income housing tax credit compliance period. And so in these 15 years, basically it has to fit all these regulations like um, for your properties, at least um, 40, I think 20% have to be uh, rented to people making less than 50% or half of the AMI, area medium income. And 40% of those units have to be um, rented to people that make less than 60% of area medium income. So all these compliance regulations you have to meet in the 15 years in the house, the property has to remain affordable for tax credit projects. I'm talking about at least 30 years. 30 years is the minimum. And for like home funds, if you get a home funds for your affordable housing, that's a little bit shorter. Like, but still, like you have to maintain the affordable. You can't just randomly increase the rent to, <laughs> to get more revenue. Then you will get a violation. Then it will be really difficult for you to try to apply for other fundings for you know property. Uh, affordable housing pro projects. You know, it's heavily regulated and et cetera, because in the development process, you always meet have problems and all kinds of problems, unexpected, expected, just keep popping up. My predecessor, Carolyn Vitali, she was the former vice president of um, URADC, once mentioned to me, this job, how this job basically gives you challenges every day. Every day you have a new challenge. So are you ready for this? Okay. <laughs> and um, give you some um, brief introduction about our recent projects, a most recent one and the, the one we just finished. The one we just finished is called uh, Jefferson Wallen Sack Apartments. This is an affordable housing community in the metropolitan Rochester area with two different sites. So the Wallen Sack Beauty is rehabilitated into 12 apartments for small families. Wallen Sack Beauty is actually a historic beauty. It's been, um, it, was, it was used to be the headquarter of this Wallensack Optical Manufacturing Corporation. They, uh, it's founded in 1890s. 
Philip, I, I think it's a uh, Wallenstack brothers or people named uh, last name at Wallenstack to make those uh, uh, shuffles, shuffles of cameras, basically. It's the optical manufacturer and it has been vacant and deteriorated for over 15 years. And um, the URADC turned that to a uh, affordable housing apartments for small families. I will show you a picture in the next slide. And the Jefferson building is a newly constructed on the long time vacant lot on Jefferson Avenue. It's a three story building and it was 19 apartments. And both buildings prevent, represent an investment in the city of Rochester and help to st stabilize the surrounding neighborhoods. This project also provide individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities with supportive housing units to um, assist their ability to live within their community. So that's it. our goal, try to build the inclusive community and create a more equitable Rochester. So the left picture on the left are showing the Wallenstack building, which is a historically renovated building. And the, on the right are the Jefferson building, a new story, um, three-story apartments. So a total of 41 units. And our reason, most recent project that's still under construction is called LTP Westside, Lease to Purchase. So um, this project, uh, it's also 41 units, like Jefferson Wallenstack. And but it's instead of uh, rental apartments, it's actually scattered site single family housing, like homes units. And I just show, showed you some of those, um, you know, the construction period in the previous slide. It, 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 this project is based on a successful model pioneered by CHN, Cleveland Housing Network, housing partners. So they created this model first, then they are our development um, partners, our consultant. And these two purchases is a new construction affordable housing. It consists of 41 single family houses. And we got uh, as two types, two bedrooms and three bedrooms. And uh, for our renters, we are looking at less than 50% area medium income renter and less than 60% area medium income renter. So those homes will transition to home ownership after the initial 15 year rental compliance period in year 16, 17, and 18. It's really based on if the tenants are ready to become a homeowner because a lot of those renters of our L2P website projects are the first time home buyers. They, for generations, they never owned their own home, own house by themselves. So this um, project is really trying to promote home ownership in the city of Rochester. And in the year 16, 17, 18, the homes are sold at substantially discounted prices, granting significant equity to the home buyer. Because um, 15 years is a little bit too far from now, so it's hard for us to project the housing price in the city of Rochester um, then. But we, Usually, we make sure it's definitely at a substantially discounted price. And the tax credit we received, the house we built has its own value, and we call that equity. Usually, the owner used to be, um, so for this project, we form an LLC, Liability Limited Corporation, based by both ULPDC <laughs> and our investors. And after 15 year period, compliance period, the investors will, at 10 years, the investor will try to exit because they received all the tax credits. Then the URETC has to buy their limited interest. This is all financial stuff. I'm learning myself too. So it, it could be, I was very confused when that was the first time I heard all these terms and things. But anyway, it's, it, it is a business. This is a business. It's a model. It's, it's not for profit. It's trying to, um, to build a better, um, uh, equitable, um, community for the low and medium income people. However, to make the project fitable and to make the project a successful, sustainable and stable, it is a business. That's why it includes a lot of financial uh, terms and projects for that. And the homes, so this brick and mortar houses we build has its own equity. After UREDC uh, purchased the limited interest from our investors, we become the owner. So for our other projects, same like affordable rental housing, those apartments, URETC owns those equities. But for this project, because we sell these houses at a substantially discounted price to those renters after they, you know, finished for 15 years, we transfer this equity of the home because their home could 
the, the value could grow and those equity do theirs. So they finally they have, you know, I heard a saying, never underestimate the power of a permanent address. They could. Yes, so uh, that's the thing. And during the 15 year, um, we're not just gonna, you know, monitor the house while they are still as renters. Also, we have a kind of home store basically to give them consultant lessons or courses, maybe once a year, twice a year about some financial or basic, you know, technical skills considering the large amount of them are never owned a, like, their own house before. So they need kind of some kind of training just to be ready to become a homeowner. Okay, so this is some of our lease to purchase West Side project. You can see two different types, like three bedrooms, I think on the right, and two bedrooms on the left, one story and two story housing. And uh, our vision. So in the future, we would like to, this is basically similar to a lot of, you know, developer organizations, um, vision or economic development corporations, vision for affordable housing, who want to expand the organization's real estate pipe pipeline by continuously um, develop new affordable housing projects and also enhance the financials of current properties because not all the properties or portfolios are, um, are generate revenues. Some maybe have bad debts and how to minimize the bad debts while try to say, um, increase the occupancy rate to generate more, to maximize the revenue is a goal. And also build staff capacity to allow for greater flexibility by like our staff take some trainings, courses, whether it's online, in person, just to, you know, to get familiar with um, the, all the process, different process, whether it's from pre-development, construction to property management, all these different um, stages of a, so we can basically um, do our job, like go good and beyond. And also develop and implement sustainable business model. And then we're gonna initiate some strategic planning process that we will incorporate that part in there. So our strategy, we'll partner with home store to maximize rental assistance funds. In a um, previous slide, I mentioned about how important the federal rental assistance, it could really, like make the developers more confident saying, telling the investors that after the project is completed, we will have renters and the renters will pay their rent. So we do want to maximize the rental system funds, especially during COVID. A lot of our renters are affected by the pandemic, lose, lost their job, can pay. So the higher the rental assistance funds we receive and the better, the more sustainable, stable our properties, more healthy our portfolio will be. And also continue to identify more cost-effective ways to manage existing portfolio. Uh, it's similar, also trying to, you know, increasing the occupancy rate and et cetera with a property managed part. And a complete current um, projects basically is leads to purchase website and continue to identify new projects. And we're looking at the phase two of lease to purchase and project partners. And also identify funding streams, which allow focus on home ownership, as this uh, lease to purchase. Um, it's interesting, like when the Urban League of Rochester Economic Development Corporation first founded in 1986, our focus is more on home ownership. We build single family housings for low and medium income, first time home buyers. But then we kind of shifted at the early 21st century to be more focused on affordable housing rental housing development. Now we're kind of shift back to promote home ownership. And I also want to like, share with you some useful sources. You can see Urban Institute, I mentioned a lot. It's really interesting. They got some very cool interactive tools. I um, suggest you or recommend you to, um, you know, go just play with it and uh, get, if you're interested, get more um, information about the financial part, how affordable housing is developed, especially um, based on the US context. And the Urban Land Institute, uh, this website, uh, link I put it here, is basically saying like 10 principles for like a sustainable affordable housing. And um, I, I used to be, when I took that the real estate um, development courses in the in University of Buffalo, I was a student member of the Urban Land Institute 
Now, I think my membership may be expired, but they also, not only they provide a lot of useful online information about affordable housing development, also they publish a lot of textbooks, like one of my textbooks actually I think is published by Urban Land Institute. And also local housing solutions. They have very, some very interesting videos like the video I showed you earlier. What is affordable housing is from local housing solutions. And besides those sources, you can also find um, some other sources saying, saying New York State Association of Affordable Housing. You can say that too. And some um, HUD, the HUD, U.S. Department of Housing and Development the Corporation, they talk a lot about the public housing and the procedures to um, how, how you apply, how they screen those applicants first thing. For example, first they want to see your income level. Do you fit that criteria? And they want to see whether you are the U.S. citizen or you um, have some certain immigration status to be applied to that. And then they um, also, then after that, then they would do a background check just to screen you to make sure that, uh, you know, you, your behavior will not affect, have a de uh, like a detrimental effect to the other, to the community, to the other renters. So yeah, that's very interesting to definitely check out US Department of Housing and Urban Development, which they provide the early founding, so the founding source for our early affordable housing rental multi-family rental projects. Okay, thank you so much. That's all my uh, presentation. I apologize because I'm fairly new in this industry, so I'm still actually learning a lot myself too, in the work and uh, off, the, uh, off the work. So now I guess it's question time. I welcome all the questions. You can ask me questions related to the topic I just presented or just questions about my personal experience transition from academic students to a practitioner in the industry. Just, you know, I welcome all the questions. And I thank you again, Professor Johan. Thank you very much, Dr. Hao Zhang. Fabulous presentation. Um, before we come to the question and answer session, let me uh, briefly summarize the the lecture that you have been delivered to the uh, colleagues and students here. Uh, let me try to do it in Bahasa Indonesia, in, in Bahasa, if you don't mind, Dr. Hausan. Absolutely. So, Bapak, Ibu, dan rekan-rekan mahasiswa, uh, penyediaan hmm. low-income housing bagi masyarakat berpenghasilan rendah sampai menengah memang menjadi problem, tidak hanya di Indonesia tapi juga menjadi problem yang prevalent di Amerika Serikat. Negara yang kita pikir bahwasanya negaranya sangat makmur begitu. Tapi negara Amerika Serikat ini juga memiliki masalah terkait dengan penyediaan perumahan bagi kalangan menengah ke bawah. Yang masuk kategori sebagai kalangan menengah ke bawah itu biasanya yang race-nya uh, black atau orang kulit hitam, uh, lalu kemudian Hispanic atau uh, Latino atau Latina, lalu kemudian imigran dan elderly atau kaum yang sudah lanjut usia. Biasanya mereka masuk ke dalam kategori low income people. Nah, isu ini dicoba untuk dipecahkan, jadi negara hadir, negara Amerika Serikat dalam hal ini adalah federal government, hadir untuk memberikan solusi, memberikan tax credit atau keringanan bentuk keringanan pajak kepada para developer yang mau membangun dan mengoperasikan low income houses. Jadi bisa berbentuk apartment, bisa berbentuk landed housing. Jadi kalau ada developer atau NGO, non-profit organization seperti perusahaannya atau corporation-nya Dr. Hausa, maka pemerintah akan memberikan tax credit tapi memang seperti Dr. Hausang presentasikan tadi, banyak challenge yang ditemui untuk membangun dan mengoperasionalkan low income housing. Jadi, walaupun ini adalah non-profit organization, tetap aja ada challenge-nya begitu Bapak-Ibu. Ini heavily regulated, lalu kemudian kadang-kadang sulit untuk mencari site, mencari apa namanya, lokasi untuk pembangunan rumah berpenghasilan rendah karena memang balik lagi Amerika kan 
kapitalis ya Bapak Ibu. Kalau memang tanah itu bisa dipakai untuk uh, perumahan yang lebih mahal, kenapa harus uh, diinvest untuk perumahan yang uh, low income housing? Lalu kemudian ada isu mengenai disparitas uh, terkait dengan uh, racial um, Racial segregation biasanya kalau lingkungan suburban yang established uh, mereka tidak ingin ada low income housing berada di dalam lokasinya karena low income housing itu potensial untuk menurunkan uh, nilai properti mereka nilai properti rumahnya nilai kawasan dan sebagainya jadi ada challenge di situ juga di sisi lain ada cost yang terus uh, meningkat cost untuk pembangunan yang terus meningkat. sehingga banyak sekali challenge yang dihadapi oleh uh, NGO-NGO atau developer-developer yang mau membangun uh, perumahan untuk kalangan menengah ke bawah. Uh, Dr. Hal tadi juga menyampaikan mengenai kesulitan untuk secure funding, karena ini uh, dananya dari tax credit, jadi corporation atau developer juga harus berusaha untuk membuat apa performa mereka bagus supaya bisa continue mendapatkan tax credit bantuan dari housing and urban development atau HUD US begitu. Nah tadi juga Pak Hau sudah menyampaikan beberapa proyek atau pembangunan yang dibangun oleh Urban League UL Urban League Rochester uh, Economic Development Corporation, ULREDC. Nah, seperti itu Bapak dan Ibu, uh, Dr. Hau mengundang kita untuk uh, mengajukan pertanyaan. Uh, beliau membuka apabila Bapak dan Ibu, rekan-rekan mahasiswa ingin bertanya terkait dengan uh, low income housing, pembangunan low income housing, ataupun misalnya hal-hal terkait dengan um, uh, Uh, pembangunan uh, real estate di US dan juga mungkin ada rekan-rekan mahasiswa yang ingin bertanya mengenai uh, transisi transition between uh, apa setelah sekolah begitu lalu kemudian berkarir di US karena uh, Dr. Hausang ini berasal dari Tiongkok lalu kemudian bersekolah di Amerika Serikat lalu se- segera setelah bersekolah beliau meniti karir di sana mencari pekerjaan di sana lalu kemudian sekarang established menjadi vice president of UL REDC uh, Mangga silakan Bapak Ibu rekan-rekan mahasiswa apabila ingin mengajukan pertanyaan silakan menyalakan mic ataupun uh, menuliskan pertanyaan di chat box. We have one question over here, Dr. Hao. Uh, okay. It's from my master student, uh, Pak Dwi. Okay. Is the policy of each country different in terms of housing? For for instance, in Indonesia, for developers who develop uh, housing, we have the the ratio. So the developer has to build one uh, housing for like higher income housing, uh, mm-hmm. two uh, proportion for the middle income housing, and they have to uh, build three uh, proportion. Uh, of their development for low income housing so does it depend on country's economic condition or is there any regulation that regulates that um yes i think that's correct it does depend on different countries um situations and i think here it's saying for at least for affordable housing in the us the they require um say 20% for renters, you know, of those units, say it's a rental apartment, 20% um, for the, of the total units have to be people earning that less than 50% of area medium income. And if you're target like higher end of the low income renters, it is still low income, but they're at the higher end, which will be 60% of the, um, how to say that, like area medium income, you need at least 40%. I mean, in practice, most um, developers like make all of their units to 
people with less than you know 60% area medium income. So I think it's really depend on different countries' policies. And uh, thank you for letting me know about the Indonesian's policy, like attributing different, you know, different portion of the. Um, I think some places like what I just mentioned, you know, so certain part of the apartment have to be fitting certain low income and how low that part of population. So I think that part is similar. It could be a little bit different, just, you know, where it depends on different countries. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hojang. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that answers the question, but do we? Um, is there any other question? I have a question, not I have a question. Let me read a question sent to me over okay. here. It is, a, it's about who are entitled to get the unit. I mean, to get the low income housing unit. Does it have to be American? Low income uh, population in uh, like oh, American. I see. Business? Or immigrant can also yeah, apply for that with a certain procedure or something like that. To my knowledge, because I apologize because I'm so new in this field, I think you need to be either US citizen or US permanent resident, saying you have a green card of the US. So that's to my knowledge, but I'm not sure. I can double check the online source. I think that's at least the requirement by HUD, like HUD funded affordable housing. And for tax credit, I assume it's similar because they are basically using the public money because from the tax credit, like this, um, investors can have a tax relief when they receive the tax credit. And that's like public, basically the public government money, a public money to build this affordable housing. I think mostly they do want to benefit US citizens or at least um, green card holder. So that's my understanding, but I'm not sure about that. I will can double check then get it back to you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Hao. So because uh, for the project of lease to purchase, mm -hmm. yeah, I think the requirement must be uh, like US citizen or green card holders. Yeah, to my understanding now our applicants are US citizens. I'm not sure because we have the, um, we have a property management partners. It's like another, company home leasing basically doing all the application screening processing for the applicants so but yeah that's that's my understanding and also we have saying the high end of the uh, low income residents are saying 60 percent of area medium uh, medium income and then 50 percent and we consider extremely low income as 30 percent of area medium income and you can charge them basically more than five hundred forty dollars a month for this population so okay okay I, I think we have dr beta paramita raise hand uh, to ask question dr beta uh you thank may... you Builham. sorry i'm not on my cam i'm too lazy to find my scarf <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, hello uh, dr zhang nice to meet you here so I'm uh, just wondering about uh, the system uh, low income housing in US uh, when yeah the previous ask uh, the previous question about uh, if the foreigner uh, want to have the low income housing yeah in in Japan actually uh, we have similar case uh, yeah we live in Japan for four years so we can mm -hmm. get the low income house uh, that's rent. I'm oh, not so sure right. about how to buy. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not so sure that the Jap uh, in Japan, all the public housing supposed to be renting, not, not to buy. And then uh, I just think about in Indonesia case, because perhaps we have no previous case that foreigners have want to want to get the public housing, Bu Ilham, yeah. So perhaps foreigner here is not in the low income. So they don't have any any yeah any case about the uh, applying the low income housing in Indonesia, and another case uh, I just wondering in the US how about the percentage because uh, as you say that you're still in the New York State 
if mm -hmm. I'm correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, sure. New York State will be very over dense if I'm not take a mistake. Uh, and how about the percentage between the high rise? Uh, I mean that. Um, what is Rusun? Uh, between the apartment, low low cost of uh, low cost affordable housing uh, in apartment and in the landed house, is there any uh, percentage between this apartment and landed house in US? Uh, you talking about affordable housing percentage, yeah. basically in the US? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think for uh, let me see if I put it there. I think for um. I know it's a huge need there. So they say for every 100 extremely low income households, there are 29 affordable rental units. So I guess about one third that's available and compared to the needs. So saying like 100 households need affordable housing, but only 29 affordable housing are available now. So I guess like one third of the population, um, you know can be, that's the, for the United States. New York may be a little bit higher than the, that percentage. I would say, you know, 29% around there. But New York may be slightly higher, but I'm not sure about the um, numbers in New York State. Yes, I do live in New York State. And there's a big difference of um, the cities, basically, in New York State, the New York City. Because New York City also have a lot of high rises, affordable uh, rental housing, like, uh, like apartments. But most cities, New York City def definitely do not, do not represent the most cities of the US. Like most large cities in the US don't present the majority of cities in the US. I would say Buffalo, Rochester, those cities are more representative in the US. So um, in the US, I guess it's like one third available for the market. I don't know if that answers your question, doctor. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, still. Yeah, just just wondering, uh, because in high density, perhaps uh, the high rise building more mm -hmm. preferable for the government, because we don't have any uh, space for the yeah, like in Bandung, our city yes. now, we reach our maximum area for the residential sixty percent of our total area for it is residential, but mostly mm -hmm. in in Bandung itself, uh, we all we just uh, scrap with the landed houses, not as the apartment or a high rise uh, low cost apartment. So in Bandung itself, we still have uh, faced the problem with the low cost housing because the land, not because the yeah, not not because the price itself, uh, but because yes. the land, yeah availability. Yep. Yeah, oh yes, you are. You are absolutely correct. And that is a great point you pointed out about the land acquisition cost in high density cities. Mm -hmm. Like um, in saying in this urban institute interactive tour that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, they use Denver metropolitan area as an example instead of New York City. Cause that area is more similar to the other US. A lot of US, most US cities I would say is low density compared with Asian cities whether it's in Indonesia, in Japan, or in China, it's more um, definitely high density and the land price are not the same with the land price basically in uh, average US cities. I'm not talking about New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago, those cities. So um, yes, that is correct. And you know, with uh, your case, you mentioned in um, Indonesia and in Japan, the, uh, the big, uses cost, which is the acquisition to just to get those land are ridiculously high, which will pose some um, obstacles saying to, to the land. So in an um, average American city saying Rochester and Buffalo actually will be fairly easy because a lot of those vacant lots are owned by the city or will be purchased by, um, by the city in a relatively more fair price in the market. So which will make it a little easier. So yes, thank you for bringing that point. This is great. Yeah, thank you. So in in other case that uh, yeah, when when you talk about the suburb area, will mm -hmm. be low density, but then uh, the burden will be in the transportation. So yes, when people live in the suburb, 
they go to the office or the school uh, in the in the urban area yeah there will be mm-hmm. burden in the transportation there will be very tra- uh, uh, traffic jam like bu ilham live in the <laughs> outskirts <laughs> of our, uh, our from our university so he have to, she have to drive every every day like two hours to the university so it's very crazy <laughs> Oh, I see. Oh, wow. Yes. Transportation is an issue. And another issue in the suburb is like, can you get enough renters, like people to fill those units that you built? Because you definitely don't want a high vacancy rate that will affect your uh, revenue, like your income. And in suburbs, it's, and even some countryside of the U.S., uh, I know in for countryside, the U.S. Department of Agriculture actually will provide some funding for those um, affordable housing properties. One, like the transportation you mentioned, then another, because it's so low density, so scarce. Like, you know, you need government subsidiaries to pay for the rents for the affordable housing pro- properties you built. So that's, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Beta Parmita and Dr. Haozang. Yeah, we. I think um, the case in in Buffalo and Rochester is pretty different with uh, the case in New York City. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Because uh, in in Buffalo and Rochester, uh, it's still like landed houses and um, medium, not not really medium, uh, medium. A medium rise building only in in downtown right Dr. Hao. so yeah have like three story building or four story building for the apartment yeah. in Buffalo yes. and Manchester and many second houses as well yeah and you know we've been to New York City it's a huge difference huge New York City feels more like Asian cities yeah <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Buffalo is uh, quite different. Uh, we have other questions. Oh, Dr. Haozang, let me ask you one simple question. Does okay. uh, the the price for housing in Buffalo still in still categorized as the lowest uh, uh, price in in the U.S. currently? Oh really? I I I, I don't know. I'm not sure about it actually. It's, so you see the housing price in Buffalo is still considered relatively low in the US. Yes, last time. Um, well, ac- actually, recent, recent years, right, you see an increase of the housing price, whether it's in Buffalo or Rochester, because part of the reason is from the, mm, they call climate immigrants. So because, you know, of the climate change and some people actually willing want to move to the um, Great Lake areas, whether it's like the, the, those cities, Cleveland, Buffalo, uh, Rochester used to be like have a relative fairly, very fair, low market price. But now really you see a huge increase of the housing price here. I still live in an apartment that I rent because like purchasing a house, yes, will be a long-term goal. But with the current housing price, um, it is not easy. because I think part of the reason is the climate because you've got the water resource, the climate immigrants, which also talk a lot in all the affordable housing, basically, like meetings I participated with like mayors or people from the state attended. They talk a lot about the climate change um, impact on the um, housing market. So you you see an increase. Yeah. Oh, glad to hear. (laughs) Yeah. I I still live in the rent apartment. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, we yeah. have uh, another question from Puti Yeremia uh, dari Universitas Trisakti, so it's a private university in Jakarta, the capital city okay. of Indonesia. Her question is about how to allocate the uh, the land or uh, the site. How how to uh, how to do a proper uh, site allocation? Allocation uh, so analysis. I- uh, yeah, allocation analysis, because if you put low income housing or low income apartment in the mm-hmm. area where the property or the urbanization is already um, high 
or it's already densely populated? How how do yes. you allocate? Yes, saturated. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so that's um that's a good question, and it, it actually a lot of factors impact that housing um um allocation analysis, and this is definitely belong to the pre-development stage. This stage you require a lot of brainstorming, and that's not enough. You also that's what's included in the feasibility analysis, saying a pilot study. You actually um, either usually like myself, I can do that. So we partner with some consultant to do a market market study, like saying whether this area is already saturated with affordable housing, or you have to check about the the crime rate, right? The safety it, it is an issue here, <laughs> and the um the environment and the the people's like the, the neighborhood income level, all these factors you have to combine. But most important, uh, feasibility analysis and led by the market study, like whether after, basically after you build the project, do you have enough revenue as project entity? Can you have enough like renters to fill those units or you can, or can those renters actually pay uh, rent and if they can, great. And if they can, can you find some other funding source? Um, saying like government subsidiaries, federal, state, local, just you know, doesn't matter. Trust funds, grants, you need it all. That's why for affordable housing development, the developers have to be really, really creative because it's not uncommon for developers to gather 20 to even 30 different funding resources just to closing the gap. Because, like I mentioned. Building affordable housing is not particularly affordable. So yeah, I hope that provide a little thought of on the question. Challenging, but it's noble. It, it is a noble work to do, providing housing for the low income uh, population. I yeah, thank I'm you. I I believe so because you are creating a healthy and stable neighborhood. Because people do this is like a basic need of the house. And if people spend, say, 50% of their income in the housing, then what do you expect them to spend the rest of the 50% on food, clothing, transportation, healthcare, education? They will be, I would say, how, and they have a word for that. I think it's called a house burden. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a burden. And we want to relieve the burden as much as possible so people can spend the, the other part of their um, incomes on, the, on all the necessities in their life. So I think it's really improve their living and working conditions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question from my master's student over here mm -hmm. he about the, the price gap, like the threshold of the, the price of the low income housing. Mm -hmm. How is the regulation over there in the US? Do government, does government place a, 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 a threshold of the, the maximum price of low-income housing? Because here in Indonesia, uh, mm -hmm. government regulate uh, a maximum price for the developer to sell the, the low-income housing. So, right. yeah, so it's a little bit tricky because developers yes. would make profit, but they, they are limited with a threshold of the highest price. Uh, right the house in uh, in the other hand the developer face the difficulties of increasing um, the material cost and then the increasing of the like land acquisition and also mm -hmm. uh, yeah so they have to play with the quality of the materials in order to meet yes below the threshold tell us the story in the u.s thank you okay it's a great question um we do have the um i don't think the federal government has uh, you know single standard or benchmark for, for like, you know, for that thing, because in the US, it's uh, it's United States. So different states basically have their own laws and uh, different states have a really, really different situation. They're kind of like little, you know, independent kingdoms or states. So, um, so each state basically based on their own, mostly income, like, you know, income level, they have different um, standard or like a bar highest. I'm not sure about the number in New York State, but I can double check that. What's the highest, you know, in New York State? It should be, I think it's um, probably differentiated by state. Or sometimes in the states, probably by different counties, different areas. And um, for the, so 
uh, yes, and for the quality control part, that's also very important. So we have seen for this lease to purchase website, that's the, and our most recent project that's under construction. We have an environmental consultant. Basically, they do those environmental analysis. They have to test the air. Okay, see the material use is not toxic to the potential renters. They have to test, make sure it's lower certain like bars or benchmark. So the city will issue you a certificate of occupancy. If there's anything wrong, then the environmental um, quality is not uh, meet with the standard, then you don't get that certificate of occupancy, then that's a huge trouble because the renters can't move in the house on time. And that will cause the delay of the project, then there will be cause the delay of developer fee, then all the parties, the builders, the, the, the constructor, the builders, the architects, the engineers, they will, their income basically will all get delayed. So, and sometimes we get penalized too for in some cases saying, um, so you don't get your developer fee basically. So um, that, that would be big trouble. So definitely quality control is, is, is very important. And the city will you know, require the documents, they review it and they issue a certificate of occupancy. So you can move the renters. Um, so you can let the renters actually stay living there. And for the materials, Basically, the builders have to um, pro provide reports, I think, monthly to the city, to the government, to make sure they use the right material. And during the pandemic, to be honest, in practice, we, we uh, and encountered a lot of change, change of orders, which means the increase of the price, like the lumber, lumber um, price and the metal, like the steel, all these prices are soared during the pandemic. So a lot of times we have to tell developers, look, we need to increase the cost because that's just how it is. Because you can build houses that's not, um, that, that will crash. <laughs> that's, that, that's a big issue. And um, that we have to keep in mind. And also the, the, the state, because they give you the tax credit, you found you to build these houses, they have all these regulations. So even in the basement, right? They, they have like a, a window for one of our houses. You can actually open the window in case you are like saying you are having fun in the basement, but somehow there's a fire. So these windows can actually open so you can get out from that, the basement. Those are all uh, regulated in those, uh, you know, tax credit um, housing regulations. You, you have to, the architecture and the architects and the engineer who design those house has to meet this. And there are have people, definitely people from the city, from the government to check this, to make sure your house, um, your properties meet those criteria. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Jadi Pak Himawan, kelihatannya kalau di US, pemerintah itu tidak memberikan threshold cap, ini maksimum harga yang harus dibeli, eh, harus dijual, dirilis. Karena di sana building code-nya sangat strict. Uh, the strict building code, strict regulation. Uh, because of the extreme weather, Buffalo is very notorious for the, the cold and the snow, right, Dr. Zhang? Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Jamie uh, Rochester. Jamie Rochester, yeah. So yep. basically, pemerintah tetap, walaupun ini adalah low-income housing, uh, building codes harus tetap ditegakkan. Material basement mesir seperti apa, bukaan di basement seperti apa, ketebalan dinding mesti seperti apa, insulation mesti seperti apa, insulation uh, atap mesti seperti apa, itu dulu yang harus dipenuhi. Nanti developer bisa bilang, oh dengan harga segini untuk memenuhi seluruh building codes atau persyaratan ini, harga harga yang minimum itu adalah segini, nggak bisa di, 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 ditekan lagi dari itu. Jadi developer bisa uh, bilang ke pemerintah, bahwasanya uh, nggak bisa set up uh, 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 maximum price is really depend on on the uh, region the region yeah the region dan juga uh, asalkan bangunan itu laik gitu ya beda kalau di Indonesia kan yang dipatok adalah harga maksimumnya segitu 155 juta untuk land acquisitionnya juga untuk materialnya juga jadi biasanya developer tuh mainnya dari material di di dikurangi so because here in Indonesia that the housing because the price mm -hmm. is limited I mean, uh, government set the maximum um, price for the low-income housing. So some okay. developers, developers play with the materials, uh, like lowering the quality of the materials. Hmm. And 
yeah, basically uh, not meal, not meeting the building code or building regulation. That's why the quality is uh, quite low. The quality of uh, low income uh, housing is quite low because of th that regulation. So there right, I think. Yeah, in the end, low income population are the one who who are jeopardized or who need to sacrifice. Right, and I don't think that's just the Indonesian's issue. It's I definitely hurting some other uh, countries, probably in China, maybe not affordable housing, but some other maybe you know housings. We heard about the clubs or in even Japan. I don't know if I heard about that, but just, you know, it's definitely not unique in Indonesia. I mean, people, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, kami mengundang kembali pertanyaan dari Bapak Ibu atau rekan-rekan mahasiswa yang ingin mengajukan pertanyaan. Uh, silakan. Kita masih punya waktu. Sampai dengan jam 12 siang sebelum nanti kita akhiri pertemuan kita. Mungkin dari mahasiswa saya, dari mahasiswa yang mengontrak arsitektur lingkungan berkelanjutan, mungkin ada pertanyaan atau dari mahasiswa 2018. Yeah, do you face the same problem? Because my problem always, <laughs> my challenge will be to challenge my, uh, my students to mm -hmm. talk, uh, to, uh, to have a courage to talk, to have a courage to ask question or, uh, or just maybe um, have a statement or something like that. The, 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 the silent moment. Yeah, the, the culture is pretty different uh, from the U.S. and in, in Indonesia. Maybe I, I should encourage my student to have courage to talk. Mungkin rekan-rekan mahasiswa ada pertanyaan dalam bahasa Indonesia yang bisa ditanyakan? It takes time. I'm from China, I know that. It takes time. <laughs> Or do you want to ask questions to our audience, <laughs> Dr. Hao? Oh yeah, first, thank you. First, thank you all. And um, I'm really honored to be here again. And uh, I, you know, all these questions are, are, are great. Like it helps me to understand the field more. And uh, these are brilliant questions. And we point out the, the factors of affect affordable housing development um, too, you know, and it's because there's so many stages, pre-development, then the, the, the feasibility studies, uh, the financing part, the construction part, then the end part, then um, the property management part, because you want your um, project to be sustainable. So for each part, so I'm actually taking some like online, online trainings on property management, and I plan to also learn more about it. I mean, so this is really a kind of thing like learn while you work and, um, how to say that, like, you know, it's a lifetime learning thing. Cause you know, the policies also shift from time to time. Like at this certain um, point, I would say the tax credit, you know, projects priority could be in one city. I'm not talking about the whole nation in, because you know, they, they, the federal give us tax credit to different states, make them allocate. So say New York City, maybe this year would focus on, just, you know, normal affordable housing the next year, maybe they want to change to promote more affordable home ownership. So it's definitely good from public policy perspective because you ensure the public money goes flow to the uh, where is mostly needed area. But it could pose some challenges for developers because most of the pro projects are multi-year projects. It's, it's hardly to dump everything within one year from the beginning to the end. It's usually multi-year, three, four years, it's very common. And then to operate the project usually, it's 30 to 50 years. So it's it's a multi-year thing. So yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting and I'm learning myself too. And I'm really glad to be here and learn this um, topic with you with you all. And um, yeah, if I have any question, it would be like, um, you know, if you, you want to discuss about the Indonesian's 
application, then we maybe we can do some comparative analysis or studies on the different um, you know, situations, what affect the um, factors affect the affordable housing development in Indonesia? And also is that like just a more standard around the whole country or in different places like Bandung, Jakarta, like have different um, rules or different process, you know, or Java in, in terms of affordable housing development. This or yeah, I don't know, but I'm eager to learn. Uh -huh. Oh, we have one more question, like a follow-up question from the previous okay. question from my student. Um, he asked about, uh, like I mentioned earlier about the difficulties of getting the site uh, because uh, we have, in the US, we have the issue of racial segregation. Some, yes. some suburb location are not willing to have low-income housing into the, their neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. There's an issue over there in Rochester and how to deal with that, how to deal with those racial issues. Unfortunately, it's still an issue. Although affordable housing development, the goal is to try to, um, not saying solve it, but try to mitigate the segregation and to promote more inclusive communities. So still you can see a lot of, or the majority of affordable housing development happened in the city, okay? Some are in the suburbs, Yes, but a, a big part of them are still in the city and you see less, definitely much less in the countryside. Okay, so it, it is true and uh, it, it is an issue of the segregation part and people, you know, they, people tend to live with um, people with similar income level, I would say, but also you kind of want like of a mixed income rather than just keep the segregation forever. So um, I don't think we have a, like good solutions so far, but um, people are working towards it. Because, because for, for example, from time to time, right? New York State HCR, how, uh, Home, Home Center Community Renewer, the organization that allocate those tax credits they received from federal and government they allocate to us, they have those meetings with developers for affordable housing and ask us, What's our priority? What's our concern? How to better serve, you know, the tax credit, you know, for developers to be more successful to develop affordable housing, to, 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 to try to break this uh, segregation. And people, uh, I, I, I went to those meetings, it's virtual now because of pandemic, and they, they talked about, you know, how can you promote, how, what kind of incentives you can encourage more, affordable housing development in, um, in uh, suburbs of the uh, suburbs or even countryside. Uh, I know uh, the Department of Agriculture gives some subsidiaries for a uh, countryside, to fund the countryside affordable housing development, but also for suburbs in, in the county level, they are also trying to coordinate with the state, see if we can find more funding so we can see more affordable housing development in, uh, both suburbs and countryside rather than all aggregated in the city area. This is a, an ongoing issue and people are working on that. That's all I can say. Thank you. Yeah. It's all the concerted effort for, from all of us like, uh, try to mitigate or, or uh, oh, yeah. close the gap, the racial oh, yeah. division gap. Not only this is an issue. the gap and also the, the gap between the low income population and the higher income population, right? So yes. it's an issue everywhere. It, it's a social <laughs> issue. Yes. It's a social equity, like equality issue. Yes. And um, us as uh, like you yourself, I, I really appreciate your time and your effort uh, putting your energy uh, for uh, participating in this uh, noble uh, profession, uh, noble. Uh, I mean, uh, this is has to, somebody has to do it, right? Uh, somebody has to do something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for all your time, and we thank really you. appreciate the knowledge and the the skill that you share with us, the experience in the US.
maybe the 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 context is uh, quite far different between the US and Indonesia but this mm -hmm. architecture lecture series uh, aim to broaden the knowledge so we are not uh, right. limit ourselves in the context of Indonesia we try to know what's happening there in the US in in Arab region or in other Asian countries so mm -hmm. that we have uh, a broadened perspective and maybe we can have lesson learned from the US case, from the Arab region case or from the Southeast Asia case. Um, mm. and, and maybe we can learn from the Indonesian case or Arab case or like, you know, it's always like a mutual learning part, I feel, for okay. this. And yeah, again, thank you so much, your Professor Yoham. It's um, definitely great to see you. I'm very happy. And uh, we haven't seen each other and talked for because of the pandemic. And someday I love Indonesia. Actually, I wear a shirt from um, Arikas. So it's an uh, Indonesian ah. guy in there. Yes, yeah. Uh, what's, what's, what's the name? Let me see. It's called uh, Shin, Shinta Yoga Yaka Rada. Ah, yoga yeah. Yaka. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes. So, yeah. I hope someday after the um, after the pandemic, I can actually come to Indonesia to visit, and that'll be really great. And my family, my cousins, actually went to Bali, I think. So yeah, and I want to see all. It's like a lot of cultural, a lot of food. <laughs> you know me. So yes, and thank you all very much for these wonderful questions. Those are great questions, great point uh, you point out, and thank you, definitely thank you for your time to attend this lecture. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, Bapak dan Ibu, rekan-rekan mahasiswa. Uh, terima kasih banyak sudah berpartisipasi. Saya sangat mengapresiasi rekan-rekan mahasiswa yang bertanya tadi. Uh, ini bisa membuka wawasan kita bersama. Pertanyaan-pertanyaan tadi sangat bagus. Terima kasih sudah berpartisipasi aktif pada kegiatan kali ini dan membuat sesi question and answer atau sesi diskusinya benar-benar uh, hidup dan uh, membuka wawasan kita semua. We would like to thank Dr. Hausang for being here with us uh, and sharing your knowledge. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. Send our regards to uh, regards to your family. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Same uh, to you. Thank you. So, Bapak dan Ibu, rekan-rekan mahasiswa, terima kasih atas partisipasinya pada kesempatan kali ini. Bilahi Taufik wa Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. See you in other architecture lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Haozang. Thank you all. Ibu semua, terima kasih rekan-rekan uh, uh, Bapak Ibu Panitia yang sudah uh, membantu terlaksananya pelaksanaan kegiatan kuliah uh, tamu pada kesempatan kali ini. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Yeah, Thank you. It's, it's almost midnight in the US. <laughs> right? midnight in yes, the it's 10 to midnight. <laughs> For this now. We have two half hours. That's easy to calculate. So that's good. Yeah. Sorry for the inconvenience. You have to stay up late oh, for us to. <laughs> oh no. I'm a night owl. You know that. I yeah, yeah. night owls in the in University of Buffalo. <laughs> yeah, I'm still a night owl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we just got to take care and uh, hopefully we can see each other, you know, in the near future and, you know, hopefully in person. That's the best. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have, all right. Have a great day. See you. See you guys. See you all. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Ho. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye bye. Ibu, mohon izin untuk ditutup. Bye.